Chris, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show. And I wanted to uh, start off by something that you and I were talking about before uh, we got into this conversation around the fact that we have things, of course, in uh, companies called leaders. And leaders can't be leaders without being a follower. You have to have somebody right. to follow you if you're going to be a leader. And I think everybody goes, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there's not a whole lot of people out there talking about what's the role of the follower, you know, relative to right. the role of the leader. And it's very focused on that that role, clarity of role. And, and of course, if you're a mid-level manager in some company, you might actually be a leader uh, with your team, but then with the team that you are a member of, you would be a follower, you know, so you could go back and forth uh, being a leader and a follower throughout one's day, you know, right. very common. Yeah. But tell me about the the convergence of those two roles, the the leader and the follower almost being the same thing. Talk yeah. about that. So, so that's where, um, you know, with this concept of liminality or liminal leadership comes in or liminal space comes in. And all liminal means is that you're in a transitionary state, right? Uh, a, a, a caterpillar to a butterfly. They have to go through that cocoon. They, they turn, they have that transitional state. So people that are in these middle manager positions, even some of the top positions, um, they may end up being in a liminal space where they have to lead and follow simultaneously. So um, it, when you think about this, you know, we think about the role very often and that, you you know, like uh, if you look at a quarter, you look at a heads or a tails, what's the value of the heads side? Is it any different than the value of the tails side? Well, they all have the same value, right? Um, and so you can only spend the quarter um, with the whole quarter, you can't cut it in half and spend half of it or split it in two and spend the tail side or the head side. And one's not worth more than the other. So when we think about this leadership, followership stuff, especially for people who have to lead and follow simultaneously, it becomes more important to think about the behavior than the position or the role. So uh, as an example, you have a mid mid-level manager, um, I'm going to use myself as an example. As a lieutenant in the police department, I, I, was, I was in charge of homicide, gangs, um, the undercover drug team, uh, all those high-speed, low-drag kind of stuff. I was a leader. But then as a lieutenant, I'm a mid-level manager, and I'm still a follower to the chief and the captains. And so I w you would find yourself that I, if I have to make a decision or write policy, I have to think on the leader side, how do I want to do that that's going to affect my followers? But then on the follower side, I have to think, how am I going to make this decision that's going to um, follow what the, the chief and the, and the captains and the law and everything else say that I should be doing? So when we think about this leader-follower stuff, yeah, um, if you think about it as working simultaneously and mushing those roles together, I don't know how you, you know, there's different ways to think about it in your head. Um, that's what it's about. In your definition that you would be both leader and follower because these behaviors are mm -hmm. ubiquitous or transferable. Right. Take that concept. Then is there any value in calling yourself a leader or a follower? Do we need another term? that encompasses both that's more focused on behaviors less on the role yeah so that's one of the things that you know i've been thinking about and, and kind of struggled with because um you're in that liminal space are you a liminal leader if you are you're also a liminal follower and uh you know maybe we should just say liminal person you know I, I use leader because most people have this thing where they say that being a follower is less than a leader well, I don't believe so but if you say I'm a liminal leader now now you can talk about the concept of leadership and transitioning to the leader follower and doing both um, you know so yeah that is it would be better to have some other term just make make up a term well maybe that's your next book my friend um, so <laughs> that's right. Reintroduce a new term. So right. I guess 
yeah. and, and this is an interesting sort of intellectual uh, concept that you're you're yeah. providing, and I think it makes sense for people. And I also want to ask another question about this, which is, I get that there are certain behaviors that are consistent with the role, call it with quotes of follower and that of leader, mm -hmm. listening, for example, uh, agility, for example. Um, you throw in an, any number of great behaviors that are going to be needed for either circumstance. But are there not within our sort of lexicon of, of terminologies this, um, this desire to label what it is that I am to do and the role that I play in that by saying that I'm a follower, I am serving the mission, goals, strategies of a company or a leader. And if I am a leader, my role, if you were to define it as such, is to make sure that those people that report to me, aka followers, mm -hmm. would then have the appropriate direction, support, accountability, all sorts of other things. So are you suggesting that we completely throw out the, the terms leader and follower because everything is flat and ubiquitous? Or is it a and we need to see the commonalities between these two? Correct. Yeah, it's not an either or, you know, and that's what I'm getting at is that it's not we're not talking you're either a leader or a follower. And most people think of you are doing one or the other. Or you switch from one role to the other role. That's what most people think. And 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 that's worked for us for years and years and years. However, now we have situations where um, people are leading and following simultaneously. And it's not an or it's not an either or it's an and. So I, I, I'm leading and following at the same time. So if I'm leading and following at the same time, then the behavior becomes more important than the role. And, and that's Agreed. where, yeah, that's where this other uh, part of the book comes in, which is tessellations of behavior. Which we'll get to in a second. I love that word. Okay. Great scrappy cool. word. So, so if you were to go back to your example, Chris, and say, okay, I'm a mid-level manager and I am supporting the people that report to me, providing direction, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I'm also making sure that it aligns with my person that I support, call it right. a leader for terminology. So these sort of things are happening at the same time. So I, I, yes. I get that kind of thing. But my actions with my quote unquote boss will be different in terms of what they expect from me than the actions that I might perform to those reporting to me. They may expect different things from me. So then it kind of goes back to the idea that it's an and. We have behaviors that are ubiquitous, but we also have roles that are slightly different. Am I right. saying this correctly? Yeah, and, and, and depending on the task, you could have... <laughs> This is going to sound real. We're really getting out of here. Yeah, this could be. <laughs> all right. So this could be, depending on the task, it could be a, a straight followership role. Be, depending on the task, it could be a leadership role. However, when you talk about um, tracer behaviors of, of great leaders and uh, exemplary followers, things like um, visionary um, being positive, being proactive. I'm looking at a list here that I have. Um, okay. Being assertive, authentic, clear, uh, flexible, all of those things. It doesn't really matter whether you're leading or following. Those are those, like you call them, ubiquitous behaviors that are just there. And so, yeah. So, okay. so I think yeah. that it is task related, uh, okay. a lot of this. Yeah. So let's just do a quick seventh inning stretch for a second. Not that we're seven seven innings into this we just got started but let's right take a step back for a second so people are listening in on this going okay that's interesting i get you this makes sense uh you got me one over but i'm thinking now what would i do with this insight how do i operationalize chris what you just said how do i what do i do to make myself a better leader follower member of a team you fill in the blank right so that's the other half of this book and and that's where we talk about the behaviors. 
So what I've done over the last 10 years, uh, I'd say the last 10 years, probably about 13 years, uh, about 10 years of, of meeting with people and teaching leadership and teaching followership, um, I would ask for two traits from everybody in the audience, two traits of great leaders. And I'd make a list and, you know, check mark if it's the duplicate or something like that. And then like a good consultant, you plaster all that stuff up on the wall, you know, yeah. and paper and, um, and, you know, just mess up the whole room. And, uh, but then get to talking about followership and I go back to those lists and I'd say, how many of these traits or behaviors of great leaders do you not want in your followers? And so after doing this time and time and time again, uh, I created, I kept saving those and I created a list of 86 behaviors that people want out of their leaders and followers. The same ones, the same items. Yes. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of the same. Th they want the same thing out of both leaders and followers, and that's this list of eighty-six behaviors that I came up with. And so then you take this list of eighty-six behaviors, and um, the average organization has your upper level, and then it has your mid level, and then it has your operational level, right? And so you have strategic. If you look at the uh, strategic leadership models you have strategic tactical and then operational and so if you took instead of trying to memorize your mission vision values goals and whatever else we we're supposed to memorize right if you know three behaviors that you're supposed to follow at the top level the the top level the strategic the overarching thing about the entire organization let's say um Let's say the top level is um, um, honest, uh, integrity, lead by example, right? And you expect that out of everybody, but that's your, your overarching goals. And then you take your, you take, and that would be like a triangle. Uh, okay, now we're getting into this tessellation thing, the triangle. You can make squares out of triangles. You can make hexagons out of triangles, right? Uh, those are in mathematics. Those are what's called the tessellated. Uh, those are regular um, polygons. They, they're regular shapes that you can make other shapes out of, and you can meet them together without any crossover. And so, so I'm using that as a as a kind of way to have these behaviors become um, within your entire organization. So you have these three at the top. Four in the middle, which is a square. Um, and so let's say those four are humble, visionary, servant leader, and empathetic. These are some of the behaviors on my list, right? And so you do those four things as a mid-level manager or a mid-level leader or one of your liminal leaders or your liminal people. And then at the, at the operational level, you use a hexagon and you use six behaviors for each one of those, right? And um, let's, I'm going to use uh, performance-based, assertive, uh, risk-taker, street smart, uh, and decisive. I think that's six. <laughs> okay, uh, let's use one more. Um, Well-read, right? So, so now you have these 13 behaviors that not only can you identify them, you can define them. If you can define it, you can teach it. If you can teach it, you can evaluate it, right? And and that gives you the feedback with these behaviors of if your people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so, like, I work with a bunch of lawyers. And, um, you know, what does it mean to be any word you can argue with lawyers for hours and hours? I'm just going to say that. It's I love them to death, but you just pick one word and they're going to argue about what it means. So, you know, you, you pick some behavior, let's say um, humble, you define that, you can teach it, you can, you can measure it, and you can evaluate it. That gives you all the, all the things that you need to, to do your evaluation, and it sets up the culture of the organization of how you want people to be. All right, so you said earlier that when you did your 
exercise with all these different companies and ask them to identify the top leadership characteristics and then right. followed up with how many of these characteristics would you not think are important for quote unquote the followers and you said 80 percent said they're all important yeah so then are you how does that then line up with the fact that you say you've got these three different strata within an organization the strategic the tactical and the operational mm -hmm. and you've got what three on the top you have four in the middle three four and six yeah three four and six are those different behaviors for each level or are some of them a repeat going back well, to your idea that 80 percent gets to be the same behavior is at a lower level than that of the leader right so so as you as you move up the organization you focus more on those particular things so at, at the operational level all th all 13 behaviors would be um, important for you from the very newest person in the warehouse to the CEO right and okay, but but they wouldn't necessarily be the your your, your level whatever it says it's the operation you wouldn't have uh, the 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 strategic level share your same correct behaviors they would be unique to that level right okay. but yeah and and then right. if you, all of these you could mix and match and and you know depending on your organization and what your organization does you can put different behaviors in each of those levels all right so here's another question for you Chris this is okay. a great mental gymnastics here at uh, 2 18 2 20 in the afternoon um, <laughs> which is not normally when my brain is at its peak right so it's usually right. right after the second cup of coffee at eight in the morning exactly so, right um <laughs> so my i guess the, the the idea that i have is that sometimes these these behaviors that you're talking about um you're saying that they they can be at different levels i get that uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so what do we do then once we, once we know that, what is the, what's the action out of this? You know, what's the next step? So, so the next step is to, to make those into, put those into your performance evaluations, your expectations. Um, you know, start it with your expectations. Of course, you know, this is what we want you to be. And I don't, I'm not going to remember my, you know, my uh, mission, vision, values. I'm not going to run out the door and slap them as I, I'm going out to run, you know, do my work or whatever. It, that's not the case. But when I'm doing those things, when I'm engaged with whatever I'm engaged with or people, I know I need to be humble. I know I need to be, I, I'm just, you know, you just pick out these ones. And really it guides your behavior. And then um, as you're guiding your behavior, as, as these help guide your behavior, it also, uh, if, if you're using the same ones throughout the, the entire company, throughout the, the thing, it makes everybody uh, consistent. They know what it's supposed to be. They, okay. they know when somebody's working and not doing what they're supposed to be doing. I like what you're saying, man. I really do. I, and I want to get uh, a, a little deeper into this. Uh, yeah. So I have this analogy that I might really be, uh, I might really enjoy Italian cooking. Back when okay. my wife and I are going to Rome and we're going to go visit Tuscany and we're going to probably eat at some really nice restaurants. Great. So I, could, I would call myself a great eater. I can, <laughs> I would look, I would eat a plate of pasta and I would maybe be able to go, mm, God, I, I really got the, I tasted the, the pesto and I tasted the, the whatever, right? I got it. Right. Yeah. Ask me to be a cook in that kitchen. That's a whole nother deal. Right. So I'm wondering is who chooses these key words, these behaviors? Are we asking the, the eaters to design <laughs> the meal by which they eat? Or are we leaving it to some experts, yourself included, other yeah. people who understand organizational design, they understand the vision, mission of the organization, the customer needs and all that kind of stuff, who says, this is what we need mm -hmm. in order to meet our mission, in order to meet our customer expectations, in order to be competitive in the market, blah, 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 blah. And that's how that's being designed. And these mm -hmm. are the words that are going to be chosen. Or are we letting the rank and file choose those words? Or is it a combination of both? 
It's actually a combination of both. And uh, in the book, it's, it's, a, it's a fictional company called Plink Industries. This consultant comes in very quickly, and, and she's super good, and so good that she gets things done in a matter of weeks, which, you know, never happens. Right. So, <laughs> right. So, you know, she comes in, and um, what they do is they do these workshops where they talk about the strategic level, they talk about the, the tactical or tactical level, and they talk about the operational level. And they have people in those levels discuss this and they report out on them and they choose these and they get into arguments over what the words mean. And, you know, so, so it's actually both. It's everybody from the CEO down to, um, you know, the newest person is involved in this. And you have these discussions and what does this mean? Is this something we can live with? Is, is this a, a, a thing that we feel impo is important at this level? So that's how we get that. I've been uh, big on the last few years around alignment and um, aligning the individual to the team, to the team, to the promises they have to make to their customers, whether they be internal or external customers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a top down, a, a, a top down approach. You know, I think right. um, Amazon wrote a book about that working backwards, right? What's right. What, what is our overall goal and how do we fill in the gaps? Right. And so is that in a sense, what you're, you are suggesting is that these words are under the context of what it is we are all here to do mm -hmm. in addition to how we do it, which is going Correct. To be extremely important. It's the, it's the confluence of both. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, if you're like, I came from a law enforcement background, which would be very different from having a coffee shop. Right. You know I mean? Right. So yeah, you would, you would pick different behaviors for the overall and for the tactical and for and but it does have to fit with your, your overall organizational goal so one of the other things i find that's uh, kind of a conundrum in a way is we're well, not a conundrum it's a, it's a it's a it's a problem it's on one hand to create this unity to create this team this culture whereby we're all mm -hmm. rowing in the same direction right mm -hmm. uh, certainly with healthy psychological safety and conflict and all the things that make for creativity and engagement and all Great. those things has to happen at the same time. But right. I also do think that, that you might choose a particular word and try, I, I'm not saying this is the case, but test it out. Let me see if I, 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 I you how you respond to this, that the idea is that the old um, adage of the golden rule that treat others the way you want to be treated I think now has been sort of put upside down and been told, no, that's not the way it works. That we're too individual in terms of our approach, our style, our sentiment, the way we want to make decisions, that the way you, Chris, want to be treated is maybe not necessarily uh, the way I want to be treated. And if I treat right. you the way I want to be treated, then I could actually inadvertently upset you, you know, even though Correct. I'm doing what I think I think you would need because it's what I need. So right. then when you start bringing it down to those individualistic needs and desires for mm -hmm. all sorts of things, communication, decision-making, how we work, we have different layers within the organization that is baby boomers all the way down at Gen X's and Gen Y's and, you know, everything in between who all have their right. own unique sort of flavor, their own unique way to eat pasta, you know, right. they want more cheese and somebody else wants more pepper. How do you then account for all of that agility need, all of that, I need this special sauce for me that might be different for you in this? So, so that's, that's where um, when you think about these behaviors, you know, picking, picking the behavior, defining the behavior, what does that mean? Is this something everybody can live with? Is this, it's almost like, it's, it, yeah, it's almost like having a committee design your organizational culture. Right. And um, it does get messy. Anything with people gets messy. As far as the pasta is concerned, have more wine. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm off my own heart. <laughs> there you go. But but you're right. Everybody's going to have some kind of um, something that you can, you're never going to get 100 percent of everything. And so you're going to have some people are going to have to, you know, OK, well, you know, what does risk taker mean to me? Um, it means a different thing when you're talking about 
in law enforcement, it means a different thing than you're talking about, you know, oak, instead of making blueberry scones, we're going to make lemon scones or candy cane flavored scones. You know, I mean, that may be a risk in a coffee shop, but in, in police work, it's like, okay, do we go in after the guy or do we let him sit there? <laughs> you know, I mean, so they're very different. And so there is going to have to be some discussion. You are going to have to agree to what that means or, or at least understand it. And, and as a new person coming into an organization, um, and if these are already decided, then that's part of the culture. And anytime you bring somebody into your organization, you're changing culture because you have to incorporate that person into the organization. So could agility mm -hmm. per se be the garlic of our pasta, meaning that no matter what pasta we eat, oh. we're always going to have garlic. Meaning that right. we're always going to need to be, we're always going to need to treat people in a way which is going to be consistent with their needs. Right. And it's not going to happen all the time. Of course, that doesn't always work, but we're going to make an attempt. We're Correct. going to try to find common ground. And right. that might be the proverbial garlic and all pasta that we make here if we, if we continue to knock this particular metaphor to the roof. Yeah. <laughs> Off the roof. Okay. So I think that makes sense. So, um, I, so tell me, how has this, played out tell me the before and after you know <laughs> of here's x company or team here's what we did here's the results so this is a this is a new idea okay this cool. is this is a different idea um as i've even tried it here i i like i said i work in this place with a bunch of lawyers and um they're they're wanting to stick with the traditional vision mission values it's like okay well <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, so there's not a lot of people that are, that are, have used this because this just came out. I just published this, uh, May 3rd. So I ha I've had a lot of interest, uh, a lot of people talking about it, but when you look at, I, I can't say it, I did it with X company and this is what happened. I, you know, I did it with this company and this is what happened. So I, I wish I could do that right now, but this is so fresh and so new that we haven't done that. I haven't given, had that happen yet. So given your, I don't know what your situation is with your current, you know, employer, but are you in a sense seeking out case studies to use this model yes. with like, Hey, by the way, everybody out there, Chris would like to talk to you. If you happen to have an interest in taking these ideas and running with it, he's the guy that can help you do it. Are you saying that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to know that. <laughs> yeah, and and in the book I have um, I have the the different methods. Uh, it, it's I, I put in a chapter in the back that's uh, call it uh, resources memos and resources, and what it does is it basically describes how to do that, how to how to make that happen. So organizations can look at the book and and try to do it on their own, or I can come in and and do it with them. So. If you, I get this from an, a team level where you've got several people or even an organizational level where you have several others, mm -hmm. you could go down this path. You could test this out and, and measure it to your point. If you can define Correct. it and teach it, you can measure it. All that makes sense. What if I'm a, a, a person in a company that goes, ah, this makes sense. Can I orient my life around this in some ways? Can I apply some of these ideas that, that Chris has just shared with me in my own life, even though I don't necessarily have my team buying into it? Is, the, is this not for the individual? Or could this be something that the team or the company only has to do? Well, I would say it, it, it is for an individual because we have our individual values. We have our individual mm -hmm. um, beliefs, right? Those, that's, that's what this is. When we put it into an organization, now we have to define it. Now we have to say what it means to everybody in that organization. But an individual could take these same behaviors and, and do these same behaviors. Say, these are my three most important behaviors. These are my four that I'm going to use when I interact with people. These are the six that I'm going to use in, in serving people or helping other people. You could do that. I mean, I, I hadn't gone down that road very much, but the, it's it's fairly natural. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, again, I've told people this on my podcast before, and I mentioned it in the TED Talk that before 
few years before I met my wife, I had gone through a, a divorce and I said, well, that didn't work. What do I want? And so writing up all the characteristics of the new person I would like to have in my life, wrote a line down the middle of the page. And I went, what kind of behaviors, going back to your idea, Chris, mm -hmm. do I need to be able to uh, master in order to attract the person who's on the left-hand side of the page? Right. Put it together, work on that. You know, hopefully it got a little bit better. And about two years later, that person showed up, read that left side of the page, didn't realize that it was written three years before. I thought I was describing her. She is mm -hmm. currently my current business partner, my soulmate and my wife. And I do believe in the power of what you just said. So I don't think right. that you can discount what you just said. Thought, well, I haven't thought about it. I really think that this particular idea of translating it down to the individual level where people go, these are the three behaviors that will help transform my life when it comes to my family when it comes to my own personal development, when yep. it comes to working yep. in a company. And if I don't know that, then how do I go to work on myself? Right, right. And, and it's the same with an organization. If you can say these are the 13 behaviors we want you to, we want in our organization, and this, then that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you, have right. pasta, did you have pasta on that left side, on that list? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Sorry. But we should probably name this episode the Pasta Chronicles or something. There you go. <laughs> That's nobody funny. will know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> right. I thought this was a cooking show. No, it's a situation about leadership. <laughs> right. So, Chris, this has been really great. Tell people how they can follow you. Tell a little bit more about your book. If you've got more than one, let's hear it. Yeah, I, I've got three books, uh, Liminal Space, Reshaping Leadership and Followership, Score Performance Counseling, and then uh, another one called Because Why, Understanding Behavior and Exigencies. I kind of wrote them in reverse, where one talks about building behaviors, one talks about um, correcting or transforming behaviors, changing behaviors, and then the other one talks about evaluating behaviors. But I wrote that one first and then kind of went backwards. Bring them back so, to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you can get a hold of me either on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm all over on LinkedIn. Um, Facebook, uh, my company, CMF Leadership Consulting. Uh, it's on the web, www.cmfleadership.com. Um, so any one of those would work. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's all, all right. Okay. Okay. I hear you. I understand. Well, Chris has been really fascinating. I think you're 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 a great thinker, and you think uh, obviously from a systems perspective, and uh, you understand the connectivity of things. You understand the alignment of things. You understand uh, obviously how to teach a lot. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have you on the show. It's been a lot of fun. You bet.